<laughs> and and um, I will I will also give Barry the slides of the Gehlen talk, but I have to correct some of the errors that are still in there. Okay, so um, complex systems and the limits of um, cognitive science, science, I will. Where, why the replication problem is here to stay. So I will adapt it a bit to, to my newer insights, but, but the main is still the same. So John, you might need us to also said that he was very prominent at the beginning of the COVID crisis by saying that COVID is not epidemiologically not a problem. He proved it. He was basically ostracized. And he's very famous. He's the world's best known epidemiologist. And in 2005, he wrote a paper called Why Most Published Research Findings Are False, which was very, very provocative. That's now almost 20 years ago, and, and things, since then, things have not improved at all. They got worse. How can this be? This is super depressing. So I think I will skip all of this. Yeah, and maybe I get back to it a bit, but I want to go directly to the problem of replication in cognitive science. So the, the replication problem is not only in cognitive science. You also have it, have it in, in medicine, um, in, art, in, in parts of biology, in psychology, which is part of cognitive science. Um, so you have, you have in many disciplines where you have empirical data, you have a replication problem. And, and so I have to um, explain a bit about statistics. Why do I have to explain this? Because statistics is a foundation of extracting. So when you do measurements that give always almost the same result, and you only have a measurement error, like in physics. So when you have a particle accelerator, for example, and you have identical conditions, then you always get, get the same result, but with a small uh, error from from uh, from the experiment settings. But they are so reliable that you then can develop a, dif a differential equation, which is usually what physicists want to do. They want to get obtain a, a differential equation. And the Schrödinger equation is one. Um, Einstein's field equations are differential equations. Uh, Newton's second law is a differential equation. So they always want to have Fourier's laws are a differential equation. So they always want differential equations. And this is because differential equation gives you a way to understand the nature of change in nature. And, but, in, but in cognitive science, you can't, and in medicine, usually you cannot have different equations because there are too many variables. The complexity of the system is too high, so you can only get outcomes. So for example, um, you can have cigarette consumption, two packages of cigarettes for so and so many years, and then you get outcomes like lung cancer. And then you cannot write down an equation that shows causally how the consumption of the cigarettes cause lung cancer, but you can establish a proportionality between the lung cancer and the smoking. And, and this is done with statistics. And basically, the first one to use was Poisson, um, who, start, who, who tested the hypothesis that there are more boys in the, among the newborn children since the French Revolution started, which was true. So, the, so normally, you have 0.5 boys, and then there were 0.51 boys. 0.52 boys and only 0.48 boys. And since then, it has been shown many times that in times of war, the proportion of boys raises. Nobody knows why, but it's happening. Because, I mean, in the end, more of them are consumed. But, but, but I, we, we don't know how this translates into the birth rate change. And he modeled it statistically how you can prove this. And this was the beginning of modern empirical statistics. So when the hypothesis is tested statistically, an alpha value is set to determine which significance there must be achieved to reject the null hypothesis. So null hypothesis in statistics is a hypothesis, for example, there is no difference in body height, is this correct, or height? Height. Height. height? height between men and women, but in reality there is a difference of, I don't know, a few inches, you know, on average, in the Caucasian population. And, uh, and, this, this, and, and so you want to reject this null hypothesis. That's what you do in statistics. And the type 1 error is the error that indicates likely that a true null hypothesis was rejected. So it is true that men and, and women have the same body height, but you get the result, it's not true. They have a difference. That would be the type 1 error. Or the, and the alpha value determines it. The beta value is the type 2 error, which indicates the likelihood of a failure to reject the fault null hypothesis. So you make a test and you say there is no difference, but in reality there is, in reality there is one. 
And so you went to that too quickly. So again, okay. So so if you have if you have a alpha test was okay. No, no, just start from that. Okay. So the alpha test says you have another hypothesis that says no difference in the body height between men and women. Now the alpha test gives you the likelihood that you that um, so now let's take a different example. So um, so you have two you have water from Buffalo and water from Erie tap water. And and uh, now you in truth there is no difference. They're chemically identical on average. But you have the hypothesis that in Erie too much fluoride is put in. So now you put the neural hypothesis there's more there there is that, that, that the, the water is the same. And if you reject it, though it's the same, that's alpha error, high water error. So, so there is no difference but to say that there is a difference. This is this is that one and time. Two error is there is really more fluoride in the Erie water than in the Buffalo water, but you fail to find it. That's type two or better. And the power of the test is one minus beta is the pre-study probability that the test rejects an hypothesis when a specific alternative hypothesis is true. So it's the ability of the test to detect the relationship and it's also called the sensitivity of the test. So now there is more fluoride in the Erie water than the Buffalo water. And the power indicates you're likely to find this. And the power is super important because if, you, if the power is too low, you will fail to detect things that are there. You will fail to, to find interesting stuff. And so the problem is that, that you, you can't increase alpha and beta at the same time. So there's always a trade that you have to do. Right? So here you see this is a probability of false positive versus a probability of true positive. And given a certain um, Set, um, range of possible results, you can always only move on this curve. So if you increase the probability of trying, of, um, of finding, um, um, uh, if you decrease the probability of finding a false positive, you also decrease the probability of finding a true positive and vice versa. So if you increase the probability of finding a true positive more and more, you also increase the probability of finding a false positive. And, and the, of course, you can design better experiments where you put this curve more and more into the corner. If it's very much in the corner, then you can increase the true positive rate without affecting the false positive rate. So the quality of the test is how, how, how much you can get with this curve to this corner. And, and this is, this is um, so, so when you think of, of tests, for example, um, to detect um, a, a human disease, like cancer. Right? So there are, if the test is here, it doesn't do anything, it doesn't help you anything, and the more you get it here, the better the test comes, and the better it becomes, and the more it's, it, it can help you to predict what really is going on. For, for sufficiently large experiments in t-distribution, which is a distribution of, of continuous probability distribution, um, that, when you com when that arises when you compare, for example, 20 women to 20 men. You have sampled them from a large set of, from a large group of people of your population, you've sampled 10 women, 10 women and 10 men, and now you measure the average size of the men and the women, the mean of their body height. This is then you, the data are distributed according to this t-distribution. And when you, you, the more you sample, you get then to the normal distribution. When you have 30,000 samples from, from each group, then you, then, you have, then you have a normal distribution. That's why in most polls for voting outcomes, you have something like 50 to 100,000 households that get questioned. So because then you approximate, according to the law of Paul Morovov and Svilnov, you already get close to the, to the normal distribution. And even better, you get close to a regular smooth distribution. And that's why, for example, in electricity um, production and consumption, you need always to produce electricity for at least 30,000 households. Because if you only produce for fifty thousand, the distribution at the consumption is is not it's it has you know dents and and uh, like um, jigsaw I mean uh, zacken you know um, like a saw yeah, pattern yeah. you know I don't know it's I don't know yeah and see what well, yeah it has peaks you know and, yeah. but but they are really like this and not smooth but but you need to you need to smoothen function so, so that you can mathematically model it. And so therefore, you need 30,000 households in electricity. And that's why this green dream of having local electricity um, production doesn't, can't work. Because 
because then there, there's never a match between electricity demand and production. And if there's no match, the machines break because the frequency of the power cannot be maintained. So, but anyhow, so, so then you have a normal distribution. Now you can formulate the power of a test. You can now beta is now, is now this expression. And you can, and what you can see is that when you fix the, the type one error, um, then the power of a test um, can only increase if you have a very, so this is the, 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 um, the difference between the mean of the two populations you're looking at. So if, if the difference is only one centimeter in body height between men and women, then, then of course, um, this expression is small. That means that a lot gets subtracted from one, the power is significantly lower than one. One is the highest. Now, if you want to make this, this expression smaller, you have to increase this, because if you increase this, then, the, uh, then, um, then this integral becomes smaller, and then you subtract less from 1. So, so therefore, increasing the effect is one way to increase the power. And so therefore, if you think of the old experiments that were done in the golden age of cognitive science, where it was invented in Leipzig, like modern psychology, experimental psychology, was invented in Leipzig in the 1870s, right? Who was the first one, Barry, again? Uh, Wundt. Wundt, Wilhelm Wundt. And, 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 and they, had, they were measuring super strong effects, right? So they were always looking at problems where this was huge. And then they had good power of the experiments and they had replicability. And then thousands and thousands of experiments, millions of experiments were done in applied psychology, and all the easy stuff with big effects was hard as if off. That's the problem. And then the other way to do it, to make this whole expression, uh, to, make this, uh, to, to, um, uh, to, to, to make this whole expression um, smaller, is by increasing n. Because if you increase n, you see n is actually, you can also say this is multiplied by square root of n, um, because you divide by n. So you could also write mu divided by sigma uh, times square root of n. Um, uh, so to make this expression bigger is to have more samples. Or a lower variance. So if this is small, th this entire expression is also bigger, then this becomes smaller, and then this becomes smaller, and then you have also a closer to one. So basically, increase this, increase this, or decrease this. Increasing the variance is very, you can do by, for example, if you can do the experiment that you want to measure the difference from one person. So for example, if you have a um, uh, treatment that is available, oh well, no, in a diagnostic procedure, for example, radiology, breast radiography, when you are screened for cancer, you can, you can, if you want to show that you have a method that is superior to another method, you can use the same woman and use the procedure on one breast and on the other breast, right? And then you can, on both breasts of, of the woman, the first method, and then again on both breasts for the same one. Or, or you can have any other, any other test that you can use on the same person twice. Now the variance drops because you don't have the differences between the individuals anymore. This is called intra-individual intra -individual cohort design. That your cohorts, the people that you observe, are is the same person. And this is also when we do a before after treatment experiment, where we have a person, we measure something, we give a treatment, we measure again on the person, then we also have an intra cohort design. But most experiments are done intra cohort so that the effect is measured between two different individuals, and that's bad because then you, you get the variance becomes higher because, of course, there's a big difference between individuals. So, three ways increase the effect, decrease the variance, increase the sample size. And this is so nice, this, this equation is really true, and here you can see if you make this big, then you, it's like decreasing the variance, right? So these are the three ways to do it. That's why I showed this equation. And now, um, experimental science is dealing with complex systems have a massive replication problem. So here's some evidence about the replication problem in experimental science. So Dreh by 2015 used prediction markets to estimate the reproducibility of scientific research. So the scope was psychology, the method was analysis of actual, actual replication studies and based on actual replication studies of, of, of 41 original studies, according to which on average about 43 of the significant research findings published in these top technologies 
can be expected to be false positives. So 40%, almost 43 are false positives. Mina wrote in 2020 a paper, What's Wrong with Social Science, How to Fix It? And he, he used all social sciences, including psychology, economics, and he used, he used prediction markets, which is a crowdsourcing method in which individuals can estimate the likelihood of reproducibility of a scientific paper by betting on whether a published result would be replicated. Prediction markets outperform a survey of individual forecasts of market participants. And there he showed that only 54% of 3,000 studies evaluated um, by prediction market were estimated as replicable. And so both of these may still overestimate the replicability quarter as there, are may, there may, may, may very well be a bias or design heterogeneity in actual replication studies. So that basically the replication studies are flawed and set. So, so, so this may be that the, the replicating scientist desires so badly to reproduce the result that he actually sets up the trial in a way that it's more likely to replicate the result. And, and it is so fascinating when you, I'm now, I, in the last, because I started a couple of, two months ago I started a new job as, a, as head of research of a small a bio, pharma, pharma or biotech company, and I read a couple of hundred papers um, in cancer research, and this is all empirical research, and you smell the bias. It's incredible how the people are desperate to replicate something, how they put tricks everywhere in the chain of the methodology of the paper to make sure that they get the results they want. It's actually very often the case is the following. They make an experiment that doesn't involve humans, right? And so they get the wrong result, quote unquote, then they change it with the experiment, change it with the, the procedure how to analyze it until they, they are just within the confidence interval of the old trial. And so I think that these quotes, looking at these papers, in disgust. Um, I think that the quotes that are given here, so it's, it's kind of, I, I was sighing again when reading a paper a couple of days ago with my co-worker, ah, you're, you're reading a replication bias paper again, you really said it to me, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh. And, then, and, and so if I look at this, this is not, I think that it's actually two thirds. So um, the bias even in replication is evident from the fact that studies which do not replicate are still being cited equally as often as those which do. So, so here are, here are this, so this is the first degree citation of, um, of, uh, of uh, past replication, green and failed replication. You see, the citation index is identical for first degree uh, citation, and also on second degree citation, it's, it's also identical. So it doesn't matter how often, how, how well the paper can be it's the citation is absolutely the same. So what, shows, what this shows to you is that it is, it is actually a form of irrational, um, irrational, I can't say that, irrational certainty of cognition that we discussed in the previous talk among the community of researchers. So they don't even look at whether the replication is possible. They just cite it because it's a friend, because they like the hypothesis, because they want to get grant funding, and so on. It's a total mess. Oh, because it's been cited a lot. Yes, uh, and, and, and so if citing scientists would apply the estimation skill, so they have, we have seen in this previous slide that science, scientists have a good, like I said, I smell the bias. So scientists have a good capability of, of seeing whether something is, is likely to replicate or not. But, but if they would apply this skill, then the falsified papers should, could, could be cited much less than validated papers. And that this is not happening shows a massive extent of bias towards the current trend in scientific communities, whatever that is in each community. And, and the bias is proportional to the hotness and political significance of the topic. topic. So you can see this in climate and COVID research, which COVID is now less hot, but it was very hot, and, and climate is still a very hot topic. The bias is, the, the more there's hype in this community, the more there's the, the bias. And, and, but, but bias is not only a question of hype. So if you think of very, very important findings, hmm, then entire theories got falsified. Like when, when Einstein falsified the ether theory, with the special, one, one, one aspect of the special theory of relativity is that it falsified the theory that ether is a medium through which light moves. And, and it was the ether theory that was still 50 years, I mean, the last paper on ether was published in 1946. So it took 50 years to root out this nonsense, or 40 years to root it out. And so, so there's also bias when there's no hype. But this, I, I, when I saw this, 
it's from 2020. I was almost falling off my chair. This graphic is so stunning. I think. Um, I mean, you can't. Couldn't make it up. I. I if if, 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 one, if somebody had asked me draw a curve, I would have said, you know, like the, 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 these are the replicated ones, and at least these are the non-replicated ones. No, there is no difference at all. It's it's, it's really terrible. Um, so another important study showed that only eight percent of studies in psychology had sufficient power, and the average power was thirty six. <laughs> And interstudy heterogeneity is higher than effect sizes. So what does this all mean? So power is usually the, the element. So when you look into a statistical textbook, they say power, the ability to find a true positive, should be 80%. I always use 90. So I always set up my experiments and I get 90. It's, it's getting already hard. You need more and more, more subjects, subjects but it can be done. Um, or, or I don't, I don't take, take, take a key value and say this, this is our effect phase we see, this is the key value, I don't believe in it, you know, yeah. because, because the power is too low, low so we are, it's really, really uncertain. But, but but here, so, so Stanley and others analyzed the state of the reproducibility in psychology research. research. They also assessed more than 12,000 effect phases from 8,000 psychology papers. They found that the average effect size, mu2 minus mu1, so that's the effect test, theta was 0.38, or 0.19 expressed as the correlation coefficient, which is in line with the average found in the first 100 years of psychology research. They show that only 8% of the analyzed studies have the power of at least 80%. The average power is 36, which is insufficient as compared to the widely accepted power minimum proposed by Cohen of 80%. Yeah, so I think that that this that this uh, that this paper by Cohen is still um, is still you know um, totally too liberal. I think 90% is better. But, but, you know, they only achieve 36 um, uh, on average, which is really ridiculous. And they also find that the heterogeneity between studies measured by the observed variation among effect sizes cannot be explained by the calculated standard errors. Because it is higher than the observed effects. The standard mean difference between two effects is 0.35, but the inter-study standard deviation due to unexplained variance is 0.41. So the, the, the random noise drowns out the effect size, right? I mean, I can't even, I don't even know how I can make this clear to you as non-empirical scientists. It's like, it's almost like saying um, Kant was a French philosopher. <laughs> and repeating it for years and years, you know. It's, 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 it's really, um, it's really, really depressing. It's an interesting hypothesis. What? Mm -hmm. Kant was a French philosopher. <laughs> So when you look at the work, well, maybe this is a delicate question. When you look at the work of some of some colleagues um, that you know personally, uh, uh, do, do you smell the uh, the problems also there? Yes, but that's because I'm um, I'm a pariah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm a co colleague outsider. So you're not a reliable. Uh, no, I'm not just not a good citizen. In a way, mm -hmm. you know, and so and so because this, I think is a Jewish part in me. I mean, ju ju I just I just want to find the error all the time, and so and so so even I mean, the recent example I, in the company I started, I a young poster came to me and said, "Oh, Jobs, I think that that the hypothesis I'm working is wrong." And I said, "Oh, why do you think so? Oh, yeah, it looks fishy. I don't understand mathematics, but it, I smell the rat." She said, and she said, ah, you know, doctor, I, I did something, the problem, I spent it. And I said, okay, I got the numbers and calculated, and it was, she was right. The, the, the whole experiment, was, which was ongoing for nine months, had no foundation at all. And it, uh, the null hypothesis that they used could not be rejected. Actually, it was even worse. The opposite was true. The opposite was statistically significant true. So, so, and and this was so depressing. So I, I think it is it is happening everywhere. And and um, but you're right that the networks are covering it up. And I mean it's different in biochemistry, where you have which is chemistry where you can really measure the educt of a biochemical reaction and quantify it. And the error bars are super low. And there's much more reproducibility. But in the uh, whenever you can't do this, the closer it's to physics, the easier it is. But, but the more complex the systems get, the further you get away from physics and the worse it becomes. Okay, let's move on. So um, then, um, 
The prompts are unchanged. The majority of published paper research findings are still false after 15 years after Johannes Jönvi's famous paper. So this is his famous paper. Um, so PPV is a positive predictive value of a study, the probability of finding that it's true. And here you see, um, it, these are power levels, right? So if you have a power of 80%, and you have now, um, uh, then you have a, a, a relationship, an a priori relationship of true to true, non-true, and, and the bias of 10%. Um, th then, then, you have, then you have a positive predictive value of 0.85. So positive predictive value describes the relationship between power, um, the, the, the true or non-true relationship, and, and the bias. And, and, the work, and so, so here you see now that, um, for example, if this relationship is 2 to 1, and the bias is higher, you need to put a higher power to still have a good PPV. But here you see already that if the relationship is not one to one and the, and the bias is 40%, even if you have a power of 80%, the PPV is only 0.41. And then it drops and drops, and, the, and you see that, that most of these studies that are done are underpowered. And Ioannidis has modeled this here with his PPV, and I won't go into the details. And, and <coughs> But, but, but it was clear to him from, from, and he assessed many trials and, and made these examples. And Paubus, um, he wrote in 1995 a great paper in, in science. And always when scientists talk about the limits of science, I'm glad because I'm Kantian in this regard. <laughs> <laughs> because, because I think that, that science is essentially limited. And, and so, and Paubus said, an important aspect that makes psychological research so hard to replicate is that the predictor and the dependent outcome variables are difficult to formalize. So that's the first point. So what does that mean? So the, the dependent variable is, for example, um, um, ability to distinguish two objects in the visual field. And now you want to establish, um, so that's a dependent variable, and you want to, you have predictors. Maybe you want to be alcohol consumption, that is the one that you can really formalize well. You can measure the alcohol in the blood. But another one could be uh, to which age group you belong. And then you say you define age group of teenagers 12 to 19 or 12 to 15. That already becomes fuzzy because some children are, uh, which, which are 15, are more mature than others. So, so depending on which predictor you use in psychology, it becomes very hard to formalize them in order to obtain reliable measurements. So already the measurement problem is much clearer in physics. In physics, you just set up a measurement apparatus and you get the measurement. It has an error, but very often the error is, is very, very small. But here you have the problem that the variables are already very often qualitative and not quantitative. The second, so in other words, psychological variables are much harder to measure in a standardized way than the basic properties of matter measured in physics. And this measurement challenge leads to massive experiment variance compared to the experiments with inanimate nature and chemistry and physics. Furthermore, human populations are made up of complex systems which show an infinite variance, even at much lower levels than those expressed in psychological variants. So the genetic heterogeneity and the pangenetic causation of basic properties, that means, so you have in human populations, you have huge genetic heterogeneity. It's, it's so big that even siblings look very different. Only, only identical twins look the same. Everybody else looks different. And, and so it's a huge. And then you, the problem is that even basic properties, bad body height, it was thought for a long time that maybe five or six genes determine body height. No. 80% need 80% of the genomes, single nucleotide variants, to, to predict body height variants. 80%. So body height is a super simple trait. But which everybody thought, you know, if, I don't know if you, whether you, you, you're too young, but there, in the 90s there was a movie called Gataka about genetic engineering of humans. And it's so stupid because 80% of, of the genome is needed to, to determine the height, let alone intelligence or whatever, you know. So it's totally, so that's called pan-genetic causation of basic properties. I think it's super important insight. And so what can be done? Taubes pointed out that the search for small effects using epidemiological or experimental approaches in human populations that measure outcomes which are hard to form as unlikely to be successful given 
the difficulties in performing proper measurement, the high variance of these populations, and the multifactorial complex overlapping interacting causation factors we are facing. So empirical research in humans seeks to prove hypothesis must target strong effects and conduct very large studies. Um, but the problem of this is that if you do very large studies, the heterogeneity of the population rises again. So there are super impressive studies that were done in the first half of the 20th century in Swiss valleys, where the population was totally in incestual. So that was great because it's like cleaning up the genome, right? I mean, you get also more imbeciles and so on. That's a side effect of it. But, but you have a super nice genome of these populations because they have inbred for hundreds of years. They didn't cross to the next mountain range, you know? And so, yes? Are there more imbeciles in Iceland? Yes. And also in the Arabic world, much more, because they're inbreeding within the tribes. So the inbreeding level of tribes, Arabic tribes, is, is also in Jewish communities there are more. Because the, the, the Orthodox Jews also do inbreeding. I mean, cousins of the second and third degree, but over several generations it hurts. You know, and, <laughs> and, and, so, and so they do this, and they suppress genetic variants. And this is great for experiments, but, but, but you can't get big populations. Because if you now have to improve more and more valleys, and oh god, now we have to get out of Switzerland because it's too little, then you get more and more. So basically, if you look, we look at our equation again, <laughs> you, you, what you're doing, you're increasing this. Sounds good, but you're also at the same time increasing this. That's bad. You know, and, and, so, and so in the end, you're stuck with the strong effects, but oops, they have already been used up. I mean, one of my best, as a young researcher, I was 28, I went to a conference in, in mouse genetics. There was a genius, an American guy. There are not many geniuses in science. He's a, he's a real genius. So he, he had, in the 70s and 80s, they made a lot of experiments where they created artificial, they basically made, for example, um, a fly that had the equivalent of trisomy 21. So they made, they made chromosomal engineering on, on flies to show the effects of if you disturb the chromosome. And this guy managed to bring this technology to the mouse. So he made trisomy 21 mice. He was so brilliant. And he was from, he was, I don't know, from, from Dixieland. I mean, he, he, was, he, was, he was dressed in a completely, he was obese with his big head and cowboy boots and so on. And he was talking this southern brawl. I can't even imitate it. I know, the easy stuff has almost all been done. <laughs> <laughs> he was droning, you know. And he was right. Because we were discussing what can we do next in all. Oh, I don't think you can do very much now. <laughs> it, was, it was great. And, and he was referring that to this, right? That, this, that the experiments where you can expect a big effect. And, and then you have the dilemma in living organisms is if you increase this, you also increase this. And I think this is so simple, but many, many, many colleagues don't see this. Oh, let's increase the N. Hey, sorry, but you will also increase the Z. And I think this is, this is something that they, that they fail to see, and that's why they, they, they go on and on. And so, um, and so um, today, because this way the academic system is set up, they are doing local underpowered trials, and, move, and the only thing that you can do is to move to large international studies. And the pharmaceutical companies already do this, or the, in physics they do it as well. Yeah? But, but, but the problem is that all these small psychology and neuroscience and so on, these departments, they all want to get their grants, their funding, and so they all do the trials with 80, 200, or 200 patients, and they have, they have unacceptable rates. You know, they are, in their experiments, they are somewhere here, you know, with, with, with positive predictive value of 0.001. I mean, that means that like, you can throw dice, it's better. You know, and because we have one six at least finding something, and, and and it's and it's it is astonishing. And I think now, when I gave the talk the last time, I I didn't. I was focusing on the complex uh, system pro aspect of it, but I now think after rereading Galen that it's actually also is an irrational cognition certain certainty of cognition problem that they really are in this community that they irrationally believe in what they're producing because otherwise their lives make no sense anymore. You know, they can quit and go home otherwise. So they have to stick to it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really pressing. And um, on the other hand, you know, in the Middle Ages, they have done alchemy, and it was also funded by the, by the nobility. So it seems that this seems also to be historically normal. Um, many hypotheses will still fail to be proven both for the reasons given by Taos and for those given on the next slide. So let's look at the next slide. 
So what Taubes didn't see is, is the underlying reasons for the replication problem. So there's a social reason, but the otherwise, the body of knowledge we have in social sciences, such as psychology, sociology, and economics, is based on strong effects which are obvious in cultures about which we have huge bodies of empirical material, like, for example, supply and demand law. Right? When there is when there's a lot of supply and little demand, um, the prices fall, and the opposite is true, and so on. Um, these effects arise despite the non agonicity of complex system processes because some patterns are very prominent and important for social groups and individuals. Like, for example, the need to have drinking water. It's very high, and so therefore, if you have little supply, the price explodes. Right? Um, another example is addictive potential of alcohol, cocaine, and opioids, peer pressure phenomenon. So, peer pressure leads to uniform behavior. Um, xenophobia is a good example of uniformity of behavior. Microeconomic phenomena such as price setting by consumer preferences and the resulting supply and demand. The social function of the gift, right? Um, the function of the social norms, memory effect of repetition, reward. So there are, these are all the basic laws. If you read sociology, applied sociology, applied psychology textbooks, you will always find such phenomena. They, are, they create really strong patterns, right? But for phenomena with more subtle effects, the underlying complex system process produces a variance which cannot be modeled using sampling paired methods. So this is super interesting. So what we've talked about are sampling methods. The sampling method is, you assume that there's a regular distribution, you draw from this distribution, and, and when you draw enough samples, you, you obtain a representative sample, and that gets, tells you the truth about the distribution. And now, in stochastic analysis, we need to sample data from a set of events that is distributed in a way that allows the sampling to be representative of the other distribution. Now comes a super important aspect that you should remember. Complex systems run non agonic processes, and they possibly change the phase space at any time. So they produce distributions that are not generated by stochastic processes we can model. So when you sample from such a set, we, you never obtain a balanced or representative group, even if the measure population parameters are shown to be equal. So I give you an example. We have a, you have the Atlantic. Waves are coming together. Every, every few seconds a new wave is coming. Now, you make a photo of the wave. You have a camera that can make a photo of the molecules. And, and, the, and you, you now make a million of photos. You can't, based on this, derive a law of how the wave is forming. Because every wave, since the waves began to form, that was, I think, two billion years ago when it was cool enough for water to form, Every single wave has been different from the other at the micro state level. So at the state level of the single molecules forming the wave, there, there are not two identical waves in billions of years. So because the wave formation process is non agonic so you can't sample waves to derive a law of waves. So there is no representative wave. There is the wave for the surf or the waves. There is a good surfing wave that's more specific now, but there's a good surfing wave, a bad surfing wave. The surfer can distinguish them and can choose to get onto his board when the good wave comes and so on. But, but, but this is at the macro level, but at the micro level they are all different. And, and, the, and so when we sample from such distribution, we can never find the truth. And, and, and if we use variables now, and this is super interesting, if we use our variables to compare groups, like we are sampling, we are, we are looking at a complex system phenomenon of which you want to, go, which you want to find something. Now we have two groups of patients of 10,000 sites each. Now we, ha ah, we are so clever. We measure 200 variables in each group, which are not the variables of interest, but the variables that are used to establish the equality of the groups. Like both have to contain the same number of women, both have to contain the same age distribution, both have to contain the same sodium chloride level in the blood, and so on and so on. But the problem is that the variables you use to show balance or representative designs only capture population features based on the strong effects. So these effects, so sex is strong, race is strong, age is strong, education is strong, prominent genetic markers are strong. Hello, these are all those ones that we know anyhow. And now we try to use them to norm the weak effects. Well, it turns out that doesn't work and nobody has seen this yet. And that's why I need to publish this paper. Because the variables do not capture the complex nature of the system we analyze it, so we obtain a soil homogeneity. We think it's homogeneous, and we think our, our sigma is low, and the hypothesis we want to prove is drowned. But in reality, the sigma is not low. We only believe it because we have measured the wrong variables: sex, age, education, number of languages spoken, and so on. And these ones are not indicative of the true variance, but we believe them. So. And now we, we base, but in reality, all the one things we want to prove are drowned by the non-agonic variance, which we cannot capture by any model. And so this is, 
This is super interesting, isn't it? It is. It's like using the homunculus fallacy, like you're explaining one. Yes. The explanation of what you're explaining. Mm -hmm. is very yes, and this happens in social science all the time. So if you look at any paper, we have shown that our distribution is clean. And then there's a table with all the properties that are identical in the rooms. So, and that's usually when my co-worker, ah, now you've seen another proof of the homogeneity of distribution table, because then I usually laugh. <laughs> not at all. Because, because for most problems they're looking at, it's not valid. And, and, so, and so, so this means that, that um, in, these, in these fields, now we have a conundrum. Because on the one hand, we can't have differential equations, because the phenomena are too complex to allow differential equations. But on the other hand, the, 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 what we then usually do in science, which is to use the statistical models, doesn't work either. And so therefore, I think that, that, that the progress, so, so what does this mean for textbooks of psychology? This is super interesting. If you think of a text, typical textbook of psychology, it contains a theory that is carrying the book, the story of the book. And then all the time, there are pieces of evidence that support the theory. Now, and then at the end of the book, you have 1,700 references. Holy shit, 80% of them are wrong. Of the, not replicable, they're just wrong. So, so the whole theory that, that carries the book is based on 80% false hypothesis. So, so this is how modern, this is what a modern textbook was. I find this super fascinating. So you can, or as basically, you can as well read a fairy tale. And the fairy tale is actually like to have more truth in it because it captures re regular phenomena of human, of human nature like fear, the dark, the evil, that's actually more applicable <laughs> than all the material that psychology takes. It's fascinating. And, and I think we should all be aware of this, and this should moderate our expectations for science. Right? We, should, we should not expect so much more to happen, at least in these sciences. And, and we should also expect it as normal that the people who do these sciences are totally misled, that they will not listen to this and they will continue because their raison d'etre, their whole way of existing depends on this. So they are totally dominated by irrational um, cognitive expectations. So, so what can we do with science? So, so where should we focus? Um, so, so I think what can always be done is to, to make descriptive models and to have interpretive models. And, and this is what philosophers do. For example, right? Philosophers can look at any. So you, as a philosopher, can choose any scientific field you're interested in, work yourself into the scientific field, and 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 describe. And that's what you do as ontologists. Then you can describe something. That, that's on what ontology is doing. Or you can also interpret it. That what what Sperry used to do before he did ontology. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm, I'm joking, Barry, but I'm trying to draw. And, and, and Was there ever a before? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know it. Because I know your old papers. And, and, um, and also our book is also quite a lot in this area. But, but, but you see that the, that the models that we want to have in sciences, the causal explanatory model, these are the models of physics, right? Um, and the predicted exact models, these are also the models of physics. They, they are... Um, they are really um, now getting harder and harder to produce new ones. And for example, in physics, if you look closely at physics, since 1927, it's 100 years ago now, until then huge progress was made here and also here. And now, it, for 100 years, it has been declined. It, it's been declining and most of the technical applications we have are based on the progress that was made before 1927. There are only very, very few technical entities we have that, 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 that are based on, on physics results after 27. And, 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 and theoretical physics is now so far away from, from experimental validation and, and, and um, that, that it's basically not producing, um, it is, it's actually, we could in a way say that these are what they're doing are not in models anymore. In, in, in string theory, they say that, that they are in a, a science in, them in itself that doesn't need experimental validation anymore because there is no possibility to validate it experimentally. And so if you would admit this, you could as well defund them to completely. But of course, they don't want to be defunded, so they got continue. But, but, but a model is usually supposed to, to provide a descriptive, explanatory, and predictive... Um, uh, um, it, it, it's a set of symbols or a structures, a structure of symbols that describe 
explain or predict an aspect of nature. And, and, and they don't do this anymore, so they really don't have models anymore. And I think, I think um, in, in a way, um, it's, it's interesting. It's, I didn't expect this when I was your age, that, that I would come to this conclusion um, later in my life, that, that the models I was cherishing most are, are, are getting out, are losing steam now, and rapidly. So thanks a lot. Done. You can ask mm -hmm. questions. Uh, so speaking of modeling and description, yeah. I was reading for this class um, Nancy Cartwright's How the Laws of Physics Lie. That's a wonderful book. And I, very difficult, so I, I think I have a grasp on it, but the, the description in particular, what I was interested in is her idea that because you have the model in mind already, the description is now a pre uh, prepared description. And how would that work into the idea of the bias that you're facing in the sense of the description itself isn't the raw description, it's going to be prepared for the model. So it's a bit different. So, okay. so you're referring to the chapter physics as a theater. And what she does there, so physicists don't have the model in mind when they start. What they have in mind is they know the repertoire of mathematics. Mm -hmm. So they know how the equations can, are allowed to look and what is not possible with the equations. So now they look at the reality. For example, a tempest with lightning. And then they, they say, well, there's a charge difference between, between the, the Earth, it's positively charged, and the cloud is negatively charged. So well, that's like a condensator. And so now they model the lightning like a condensator. But, but to do that, they have to reduce reality more and more and more. And so therefore, a textbook, a physics text, no matter where you open Feynman, he always says, for the time being, we assume this, 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 and this. And he simplifies with each assumption the reality of nature until the reality is prepared for the mathematical equation. Right. And I don't think that this is bias. So bias, we can, I come back to you to this part of it, but what I think is this sheer necessity that takes into account the limitations of mathematical modeling. So for example, if you want to use sine and cosine, in quantum mechanics, then you of course need to geometrically define quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can't use these trigonometric functions. But in reality, it's certainly not like this. But you do it because otherwise you can mathematize quantum mechanics. So, so there is a necessity, if you want to follow the Newtonian paradigm, you have to simplify reality. And so every physicist knows that his model is a simplification of reality. However, and that's why I'm saying it's not a bias, they know it. Mm. It's publicly available in each description of each experiment, and the goal is very often to build machines based on the equations. And this works astonishingly well. So because what you learn from nature and put into an equation you can now use to build a machine, this machine it will be very reliable if you maintain the preconditions of the machine, like a, a, a nuclear fission plant. So the nuclear fission plant, if you maintain the conditions that make the equations that, so to speak, on, on which it's built work, that it will produce electricity reliability. Only if you, if you, if it, if you let it get out of the scope of these equations, it will, it, it will turn into an, an atomic bomb, like Chernobyl did, mm -hmm. or Harrisburg did, almost. And, and, and I, think, I think this is, therefore, it's not bias. Bias is when you, when you have measurement data, and, that, and you basically style the acquisition of the data and the way you process them so that you get the result that you wanted before. Mm -hmm. And this is very typical of empirical science, it's not typical of physics. Yeah. But the book is, I can recommend it highly to everyone, it's a great book, and it's because it's, it is, I think, the biggest insight into, it's the best um, uh, philosophy of physics book I've ever read. And we, Barry and I, have used it a lot, and it's not, philosophers of science don't like it because it's quite depressing and sobering. I mean, I give you an example from the book for you all, for the benefit of all of you, so the laser, there are six quantum mechanical models to explain the laser. They all start with the Schrödinger equation, but they all get to explaining how the laser works in a very different way. And, and every time it's a matter of, technology, of te mathematical technique, how to evince the, the, the result from the basic equations. So in which order you integrate, and, and, and which tricks, so when you do Taylor, Tell approximation how many um, how many uh, terms of the uh, you use and so very often physicists just use the two first terms and they say let's assume the two first terms of the Taylor approximation suffice 
because if we use a third term, the mathematics gets so messy, we can't simplify the equations and so on. So they use these terms and so on. You see this everywhere. And, and uh, this she shows really, really nicely. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. Okay, other questions? So my understanding is that part of the reason why there is, uh, um, there is a place for doing something like applied ontology uh, is that we have a lot of, we have, we have much more data than we used to have respect to like 50 years ago. And we can also easily produce very bad statistical or inefficient statistical models as you have showed that work with this data. Um, but these are not helping us gaining um, real insight about the phenomena, partially for the reasons you have described, and also partially because there is a lack of conceptual clarity in organizing data, which is where you need a descriptive model that um, can be better built by someone who has the kind of education that we get as philosophers. Does it? Is, would you agree with this claim? Well, so, so I think that the, the, the real reason, so, so there, there are two reasons why for the problems in, in experimental science. One is really that, that, that the average researcher is not that good. And so when somebody, when somebody does a trial about a complicated trade with 250 patients or 250 subjects, then that, that is that, that he's, he's not thinking very clearly and so on, right? This is what Ioannidis is, is aiming at. But, but the problem is more deep because when, the, when the, the scientist does everything that has to be done fulfill what Ioannidis is asking for in good positive predictive value, high sample number, careful design of lowering variance and all of this. Even then, because of the reasons I just said, even because of the essential complexity of the phenomena that is analyzed, it may not still be adequate. So that, that's the difference between inability to obtain results for lack of skill and impossibility, if, even if the skill is the highest possible. And so in, in, in tumor biology, which I'm in the field that, that I'm working in now, I see that it's clearly the latter. And, and, and the complexity of the tumor, so, the, so if you look at a piece of tumor, the only organ that has the same level of complexity, if, even if it's just a stupid colon carcinoma, the, the complexity of this piece of tumor is as high as the complexity of a piece of human brain. That's, it's like a super complicated dysfunctional organ that is specialized to grow at the expense of the rest of the organism. And, 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 and it does it, it's so astonishing. So there are, in a tumor that is um, two or three um, millimeters cubed, there are already a billion cells. A billion, 10 to the exponent nine. And these cells, most of these cells are genetically different. So there, I mean, not all of them, there are some, of course, clonal cells. But the, the, the variance within this millimeter cube or two millimeters cube, that's when tumors get, is the earliest detection point, is so big that if you, if you treat the cell with a, the, this tumor lump with a drug that is killing some cells, you have a guarantee that there will be cells among the cells that by chance don't have the gene that you target, the property that you target. So they just don't realize that there's a drug coming. 90% of the cells may die, but 10%, just by genetic chance, don't have the equipment to feel an effect of the drug. And then, the, then they continue to grow, and two years later, you have the same problem. But now it's more, much better, much worse, because you've selected for the worst cells. And so, and so I'm giving this example to show you that it's not necessarily the lack of quality of the scientists, but that the phenomena are so difficult. Oh, so, yeah. So mathema in mathematics lies the problem, uh, it seems, or at least in the way mathematics model these, tries to model these kind of uh, complex systems. Mm -hmm. Will we ever have a new mathematics? So, so this, this question I'm always asked when I, when I present our hypothesis that, that, that AI can never be intelligent. You know? And, and uh, my answer is that we can, of course, not really know this, but that it is highly unlikely because the mathematics we have are a function of, our, of the structure of our brain. And I think that, that the structure of our brain is limited. And even if we 
we have more evolution of the brain, I, find, I can find it very unlikely to imagine that we will, it will change so radically. Because in the end, our brain is not so different from Australopithecus. And there's three million years of evolution. You know? If you see the two footprints in this museum, you think, wow, the behavior is exactly like when I was walking with my small children. Erect, overseeing the landscape, planning, they had language, this kind of rudimentary language they were developing three million years ago. You know? I mean, they had probably tools, elementary tools. So, so I think I think the, the the potential of evolution of the human brain is not so big that it will fundamentally change this. That, that, but but of course that is a metaphysical assumption that I cannot prove. But I just think it's very unlikely. As Barry always says, I'm not holding my breath. And that's <laughs> what you're saying, Barry. So. Let's talk about height. Uh, this is based on your comment now. So we did a huge experiment with, I don't know, two million subjects in order to show that height was a function of many, many genes and not yes. just a, yes. a small number of genes. And in order to do that experiment and combine all that data, we needed to use the gene ontology. Yes. And all of these big experiments use the gene ontology. And you can think of the work of the CIA as being a big experiment. Uh, and that's why they need ontology. Um, but now, the discovery that height is a polygenomic phenomenon, that is one of those true replica replicable discoveries. Yes. And so there are true replicable discoveries. So tell us about the good news. So I think, and that was so yes. two million subjects. Yeah, so, 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 is going so, so, yeah, so, so the, the reason why this worked so well is, of course, that this is a super strong effect, but it was not ever looked at before. So yes, I forgot to answer the one of your question, which is, what is a plant ontology able to do? So I think that that there is still a lot of room to squeeze out more of data by by um, by better organizing the data. So uh, another example. It was nothing positive, but I was impressed by the data um, analysis capability that was done. It was a, the, the f there was a huge retrospective study for the effectiveness of the COVID vaccines done in Israel with four million subjects or five, and it was done in weeks. And it was completely biased and terrible with regard to what it was the hypothesis it was like trying to show. It was very easy to prove that by, by looking at the selection criteria of the patients and many other things that are done. So it was, a, it was, it was, was said, it's many of bias, the bias was like a huge bleeding. I mean, the, the paper was bleeding the bias, but the data analytics was done using, using electronic medical records with perfect ontological terminology bindings. And so therefore, because every single data item of this um, Israeli state medical electronic record system is ontology based, they could basically get the data and analyze them in weeks, which usually takes years. So retrospective studies have traditionally been very hard because of this. So this is what you can achieve with applied ontology. So I think applied ontology will, for the areas where there are real effects that can be found, be, brings big advantages. I mean, the first step was that you, you now have universally co a relational databases everywhere. And now, in the next generation, your generation will have to enable those relational databases to all have uh, reliable semantics. It's just beginning. So I, th I would say in the corporate and, and public world, 1%, less than 1% of the commercial databases have semantics. So I, I give you an example. I just, I just discussed with two more scientists about a very big um, database uh, uh, for tumor data. And when I said, what is, what is, what is the meaning of your, your, the attributes of your, of your data collection, she opened a table, looked at the, at the table title, and then she looked at the values and said, it might be this. You know? and, but, but let's look at the documentation. And, and, and so, <laughs> and so this, is, this, is the, this is the tradition, the state in which, in which they are, they, they are. And I was, she didn't even realize how bad this was. And I, <laughs> <laughs> and and I um, so 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 there's huge potential, and I'm not you know I think I'm not at all trying that we shouldn't do 
that, that we should stop doing science. The question is just, traditionally, I think, free science, like we had in the 19th century, Western science was completely free, so the princes were financing the science, the dukes and, you know, and actually the best science was done in England and Germany, and there the science was completely free. The state did only select the most gifted scientists, like people like Kelvin, you know, or, or um, Maxwell, to uh, give them money and they could work on what they wanted. And, and, and then they were competing and they were forming communities where they were, and they were, there was nobody telling them what they should do. So nobody was saying, invent the real theory of relativity. No, it, it just happened, it was a spontaneous process. And, and, and then they also selected problems that were ripe for scientific investigation. Like, like, like electromagnetism had been developed, discovered, and Maxwell looked at all of this and said, that's such a mess, I want to find equations of this. So he worked his entire life on this, but it was ready for him, right, the state of affairs. And, and nowadays, and so this is, this is what scientists should do, there should, should be excellent people and they should be left to work on the problems that they think are ripe for the scientific investigation. And what is happening now, since the Manhattan Project was so successful, then we could drop the bomb on the bloody Japanese. And then, and this was uh, done in very short time with huge funding and centralization. And since then, we believe, we don't believe anymore in the right, and it was just by chance that physics was right to build the bomb. It was just by chance. It was not that, that it must always work at this. And since then, we believe that we can finance science with huge amounts. Politicians can decide what should be found out. And then it's done. This is Lysenkoism. That's what Stalin did with Lysenko. So to, to decide politically what science should achieve and then fund it. I think that is fundamentally wrong. And that's happening in climate research, for example. And it's fundamentally wrong and it doesn't lead to science. So good science needs to be free and, and needs to be, the state needs to, needs just to give it money and, and ensure that the selection of the scientists is ideal. And then- Who does the ensuring? That's so I think, I think in, the, in the 19th century, I know how it was done. So in the 19th century, so for example, Gauss, he was selected because the king of Hanover, he was a relative of the British uh, kings, cousin or something. At that time, they were still very close relatives. Now it has diverged. Actually, there is no king of Hanover. Oh, there's still a king of Hanover, but he has a compulsive obsessive aggression disorder. <laughs> But, but he's also not king anymore, but his type is different now. But and Prince of Hanover is now called. And so, but when my mother knows him, she says he's very funny. And, and, any, and anyhow, he had a program where the, the, um, the parish, the, parish, the priest, priest, I mean the reverend, the Protestant reverend, it was a Protestant country, where had, we were receiving a prize money, like headhunters, for finding talent. And so Gauss was discovered, he was an analphabet at the age of nine, he was the son of a miller, he was discovered by his parish reverend, uh, who saw that Gauss had developed on his own uh, a, a way to do bookkeeping with symbols that he f had freely invented on his own. It was a primitive way of bookkeeping for his father so that he couldn't uh, fall prey to the, uh, to the, to the fraud uh, of, of, his, of, the, of the farmers who was bring, bringing the grain. And, and the, the, pre the priest saw this and then he, he put him into this program and obtained his, his reward. So that it was a sophisticated recruiting system for talent that was designed to find talented people all over the, the population, also among the poor. And, and then, you know, the, the education system was absolutely cruel, uh, so that you, if you were not having an IQ about, about 130, you could never pass higher education. So nowadays, we, we allow masses of people with an IQ above, below 110 to go to college. And, and so the system was super selective, and it was just, and then the whole, the way the university was set up, it was just made to really, it was not, you couldn't get through it if you were not really gifted. That's why, the, and, and I think we need, you need such, I mean, there are many other conditions that need to be met, but today we don't have this anymore. And so this is the problem why this crap is, is progressing so well. Returning to the question of bias, along the lines of what you just said, is, is there a way, hmm, do you think that Part of the bias problem is believing that all problems are right for science, or that science is the solution for all problems. And we were turning to what Federico was talking about, maybe another mathematics. Not maybe mathematics, but maybe the math is good for a subset of problems, but there are other solutions that aren't being explored because the bias is to the institutional inculcation of 
this will solve everything. So, so why is why is mathematics used in empirical science? Because because um, it has been very successful to identify effects um, via via averages and so on, and by distributions by assuming. And you are right that now it is it is kind of overexploited and and we should we can reconsider whether different whether a different secondary theory is necessary. So mathematics is a type of secondary theory to solve a specific type of problem. But if this is exhausted for that field, well maybe we should go back to you know priests and shamans. Seriously, I mean, if you look at cancer, solid cancers, no no um, physician who is used to treating patients who have cancers. And these are most phys most physicians see in their profession regularly cancer because it occurs in all organ systems. If if they have a solid cancer, they never use chemotherapy. They use surgery and radiation, and then they use morphine. But they don't use chemotherapy because they know it's just a pain. It doesn't help you. And so, but they prescribe it like hell, right? So because because it's it's funded and because it's a billion dollar business. It's a, just a billion dollar business. And they if they don't prescribe it, they get less. They, they get make less money, so it's a purely economical incentive. That they know that they wouldn't. So I had actually, uh, I, I don't, I don't have the time to tell, or maybe it's uh, some person stories with the head of oncology of the Bonn University Hospital, a famous man. He recommended a therapy that has been has, has been rejected for pancreatic cancer. And I wrote him a letter. I said, I gave, I attached the paper that rejected it, and he really answered to me, "Oh dear colleague, you are so naive. You know why I'm prescribing." This. That was his reply. I mean, I, it was so shocking. And yes, I was really naive, I think. He was right. And so, and so what I'm trying to say is maybe we should stop doing this and, and use more traditional you know, soul care taking for these people and spend I, money on that. So that would be a different paradigm, right? And I you see what this, I mean? Yeah, I do. And I ask this in the sense of, in maybe a more uh, modern sense of the, the idea that there is some actual causal efficacy to the, um, oh, Delaney, what is the effect when you believe it so it's going to happen? Uh, placebo. Placebo. The placebo effect that can occur even if you know that you are told that you're being given a placebo. Yeah. And it has actual, well, at least correlative effects, maybe not causal, but maybe, I was thinking in some way of how the limits of science are, but the adherence to science are, are clashing. And trying to figure out yeah. if mathematics, yeah. there's something else. No, but 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 the, the, the mathematics we have are, are good for certain types of models, and we should sure. we should use them for these problems. But we should not try to use them for models where they don't fit. That's what I'm saying. Ah, yeah. yeah. And so we should just abandon this and and, and just use them where they where they make sense. And 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 I think um, and there is no novel mathematics that can suddenly solve problems. That that's just mm -hmm. nonsense. Um, but 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 you know that's what we can do and. And then the alternative is to use a different second secondary theory, which is to to take care of these people in another way, for example. And and um, at the moment, because because our society is organized in a very Cartesian way, because you, we are really focusing on this ca Cartesianism is focusing on these two models, right? Exact causal, explanatory, and exact predictive models. Because of this, there is it's very it's a cultural problem how to how to get, how to use a different paradigm. But minorities are doing this very successfully. Um, the DSM and these like, issues, right? Could you say that, I guess I'm wondering, with this irrational certainty, mm -hmm. do you think that there are these institutions like the DSM um, and the committee that creates it, are they just perpetuating it? Um, this irrational certainty. So, so, so I give you a great example. So when I was um, young, I, you know, I, I studied medicine before studying, uh, well, I studied medicine by chemistry and data mathematics. And when I was a young um, uh, intern in, in psychiatry, after, after, my, after I finished studying, uh, I, um, I, I had a transsexual a patient who, has a, who had, had, had um, uh, transsexual surgery and so on, and at that time it was called transsexual personality disorder, and and also DSM. Now it's called gender dysphoria. The same syndrome. The syndrome is very severe. It's very rare. It, it has it affects maybe one or two in a hundred thousand. So in a, in a town like Buffalo, you have maybe 
20 or 15 people who have this, very, very rare. It's very, it's, it, these patients are, have the highest suicide rate in psychiatry, much higher than, than schizophrenic and depressed patients. They're very sick. If you do the sexual transformation of them, they don't get cured. Often they don't get much better, but a bit. But they just suffer themselves through their lives. It's really, it's terrible. And, and I had two of them, which I treated, and, and then I read about a lot of literature. And now this irrationality in psychiatry has led, now we call this gender dysphoria. But actually dysphoria describes, dysphoria is what you have when you are very tired and are forced to work. So it's, it's a very short-lived problem that you have, and when you sleep and wake up, you're not dysphoric anymore. That's dysphoria. And so there, it is now called like this to hide the problem that it's a structural problem. Right? And, and, and so, for example, and also they don't call it transsexuality anymore, but they call it gender dysphoria. But in the end, these are people who have a fundamental problem with the identity. It's an identity disorder. That's why it's so fundamental. And, it's, and, and because if you, are, if you cannot feel at ease with your own identity, you are basically messed up. And, 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 and it's really bad. And, and, but our society doesn't allow it anymore that it's called like this, and what, has, what is the consequence? The suicide rate among these people is going up exponentially. Because they, get, they don't get the care anymore they need. They need a very special, very expensive care. But if you waste the money on mutilating children, you know, instead of treating these patients, then, then, then you can't help them anymore. So, so the consequences of this, this irrationality are that the standard of care is declined. And, and DSM is, is super strong, that all WHO, but also the DSM is perpetuating and making it worse every year. It's getting worse, and the DSM, the co every time they make a new addition, you can even vomit more. They clinicalize almost everything you experience. What then? Clinicalizing. Almost yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So, so now health is defined. Yes, <laughs> health is now defined as the total absence of any problems, the perfect happiness, which you can only induce chemically with an artificial coma. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that is now health. <laughs> I mean, I mean it's, 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 it's absurd, and, and, and I think it, it, is a, it is a sign that, that our secondary theory in medicine is, 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 utterly, is utterly, you know, going to the wrong direction. And that also this elite of people driving this has detached itself totally from, from, the cert from the irrational certainties of the normal people, who of course feel that this is nonsense, right? But 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 it has but is especially in the, among the cultural elites of the West it is not very strong. So of course normal blue collar workers don't mutilate their children. You know if a boy says I want to wear a dr girl's dress, they give it to give him the boy a girl's dress, and two weeks later he's not wearing it anymore. That's good. But in the, in the elite they're now getting puberty blockers, and three years later they're mutilated. I mean it's. It's, it's, it's for life, and they are made, actually, they, are, they can't reproduce anymore afterwards. I mean, it's terrible, and I, I think it is, a, it is a, and it's very interesting that this is happening among the elites of society, right? In, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's all about the DSM, I, that comes to my mind. In the, um, this term of detachment that you're using, um, and this Cartesian split that um, we see, yeah. like, that's so pervasive in these Western industrialist societies, do you think that the turn back towards traditional, similar to um, how you were describing the treatment of cancer, could alleviate some of the suffering, the mental suffering of like uh, depression or um, gender dysphoria? I mean, if like? you if you are told, if you have if you have seventy five years old and and you are told that cancer your cancer is so terrible, that you now you need a very expensive pharmacotherapy, and then you will have bad symptoms from the therapy. That's the one way. The other way is to say, look. You, you, this is a natural cause of death at age 75. You still have three to four years after surgery. At the end, you get as, as much morphine as you need, and then go and enjoy your life. Of course, the second person will be much better off. You just and you will just point out that its normal life expectancy is over. That that, that uh, three or four years um, can be used very productively. But if you make the person lose all her hair and vomit all the time, of course, then the time will be wasted. So I think yes, of course, but. But the forces in our society that, that enforce this, the first way of acting is are at the moment very strong. And I think you need, as an individual, you need a lot of individual strength to say no to this. Because, because it's so pervasive, pervasive in society. And that's true for many, many other phenomena right now. But, you know, I, I, I certainly can only describe it but not change anything. Of